Okay, we've been considering for the last little while uh, being a disciple. And we've been talking mainly in the context of what the heart of that instruction, that call that is in the scriptures upon us, what it really means. And we started by going to Matthew chapter 28 and indeed saw that Jesus indeed commanded his, his disciples to go and make disciples. Okay? So the goal of our lives and the goal of our church should be in some way, shape, or form centered on the thought of making as many disciples of Jesus as we possibly can. Okay? That, of course, starts with a conversion, so we must be involved with proclaiming the gospel and reaching out to people. But the goal isn't just to get them born again, as it were. It must progress beyond that to them being disciples. Why? Why do we not just stop at the proclamation of the gospel and inviting them to be saved? Why do we um, not focus on just getting them to church or something like that? Because God's will for that person, God's will for you, is life and life abundantly. Okay, This is how Jesus put it. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Okay, And I want to be careful there. He didn't say, I want you to have abundant, I want you to have an abundant life in the sense of he came so that you could, you know, have a surplus in your bank account that's so big that you could buy whatever you want without blinking. He wasn't talking about quantity, he was talking about a quality of life that of course includes provision for everything you need to do. You need money to live. Okay? Money in and of itself is not an evil thing. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. But money itself is a useful tool. And so, of course, God's going to include a provision for the things of your life. But that's not what he was focusing on there. He was talking about a quality of life. Jesus came that we who were under the bondage of sin, we who were under the, the heel of the devil oppressing us, whether we perceived it or not, Jesus came that we who were caught in sin might be set free, released from curse, delivered from our adversary, the devil, and walk in this life and life abundantly. That's what God wants. And so therefore, we cannot afford to stop at simply, yeah, I'm born again. Or, you know, these milestones that we might have in the idea of a Christian life. Well, you know, person A has been born again, but he's not baptized in water and baptized in the Spirit yet. Ah, but person B is born again and baptized in water, but not yet baptized in the Spirit. Person C is born again, baptized in the Spirit, but not in water. And we might be tempted to think in terms of a hierarchy of milestones that misses the point. Okay? Baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, an insight into who you are in Jesus. All of this is with a view to what God really wants. You living abundantly. You, and let's put it in another way, His immeasurable life manifesting in you and making all the difference. Okay? Discipleship, as we've come to understand, is another way of saying how abundant life works out in you. Okay? So that's why God wants disciples. And built into that is so much, so many insights that are worth grabbing a hold of. We'll say it again just for the sake of it echoing in our ears and being stated abundantly. The goodwill of God does not automatically work out. I think you've already experienced that in your own life. But you know, there are people who doctrinally will say, because of things that they've read in the scriptures, whatever God wants automatically happens. This idea, this, I will say, this distorted idea, this distorted idea of how the sovereignty of God works out causes people to say, if somebody got sick, God must want that. If somebody died, God must want that. If this child got molested and was killed, God must want that. I mean, I know it's strange to say it, but God has something good in there. That's ridiculous. When our understanding of Scripture ends, us, ends up with us saying absolutely outrageously ridiculous things, I don't mean in a good way, I mean like we accept evil happening as being the will of God, that should make you pause and say, wait a second, I may not have understood something here. Okay, Because this line of reasoning is getting me to say that this death 
is the will of God. When he said, I want you to have life and have life abundantly. So something is wrong here. I'm pretty sure it's not God. So therefore we rewind. Right? God wants you, let me not get too distracted here. God wants you to live. He wants you to have life. God is not offering you life as a carrot to get you to do what he wants. His whole agenda concerning you from the get-go is, I want you to live. I want you to be what I made you to be, what I always intended for you. I, it doesn't matter what has happened. You follow me, I'll bring you into it. And that idea, follow me, is be a disciple. Okay? So we must not settle for, yeah, I'm a Christian. We want to be followers of Jesus. Our aim is to be just like him, that God's will is being done in us and through us. And that's what we are called to do for everyone. Now, whose job is it to make disciples? Whose job is it to make disciples? I want you to look at the person next to you and tell them, it's mine. <laughs> look at someone and tell them, tell them, it's my job to make disciples. It's my job to make disciples. It's your job to make a disciple. Okay. So this goes beyond merely you know, some sort of shepherding type circumstance where everybody's assigned somebody else and you've got to follow up on them and check up on them. I'm not talking about the logistics and the mechanics of it. I'm talking about the heart. What is your heart? God wants Paulina to live. He wants Simona to live. He wants Simona's boss to live. And I could pick every one of us and extend that circle farther and farther and farther. He wants them to live. And so whose job is it? To the extent that I am able, I want to do my part in that person living. Okay? Now, obviously, there is choice involved here. Okay? The fact that your crabby neighbor who growls at you every time you come out, the fact that God wants that person to live and have life abundantly, doesn't overrule the fact that that person has a choice to whether to allow God's will to rule in his life or somebody else's will to rule in his life. So, of course, we, just for the sake of the record, we'll, we'll recognize it may be my job to help somebody else be a disciple, but they have a choice to make. I, it, we are not to force anybody to follow Jesus. Do you understand? It's very important that you understand that. You misrepresent God when you paint a picture that God is, if you, you know, some sort of threat over them, some sort of manipulation of them. You know, the, there's an idea in the scriptures called sorcery. And it's listed as one of the, uh, not the fruits of the spirit. Let's put it that way, okay? And, and if you're not careful, you might think that sorcery is merely getting involved with black magic or something like that. That's not what sorcery is. Sorcery, the spirit of it, is trying to get him to do what I want through whatever means. So it extends beyond, you know, spells and all that to the way I talk to get him to do what I want. That is wicked in the eyes of God. Absolutely wicked that you would manipulate through whatever means. I mean, you know, we get to know each other. We know what buttons we can push. And so when I want her to do what I want her to do, I push this particular button. The whole spirit of it is wicked because God is so far away from that. The one person who could make everyone do exactly what he wants them to do does not do it that way. So, of course, when we're talking about discipleship, I don't want us to have any notion of forcing somebody into some sort of program because we know that they, God wants life. So if they just get with the program, they would have life. We're painting the wrong picture there. Right? It always has to be an invitation. Come. God wants good things for you. Let me show you how. Let me show you. Let me share with you what I have learned about how God works. Because you know what? The will of God does not automatically work. You've got to learn. You know, in that passage in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I taught you to do. So we're confronted right away with the fact that being a disciple means learning to obey something that is not from your mind. It comes from him. There is this idea of letting go of my way and taking up his way. The whole idea of follow me. What does that imply? 
You know, if you see somebody leading and somebody following, and that person is actually following, doesn't it imply this person chooses to be led by this person? There are choices to be made. At any point, I can say, no, forget it, I'm going that way. Well, then you're no longer following. And so Jesus paints the picture of how does the will of God work out? By you following me. You progressively agreeing with me. Because my entire agenda is about, concerning you anyway, my entire agenda is that you would have life and have it abundantly. And because you have been so affected by the love and the life of God, others can be affected through you. You know, God's... Um, should I put this, a pattern that you see in Scripture that goes against the way of this world is God wants you to first receive. And having received, you can give. There are many people who are caught up in a religious idea of what it means to be a Christian that says, if I do all these things, then God would give to me. And that is a wrong platform. The right platform is God has done everything for us. I want to receive it, and because I have received it, I'm able to give. Otherwise, what do you have to give? If you don't first receive from the Lord, what is it that you could give to somebody? Won't it be just some work that started with you? Every work that starts with us is worthless in the eyes of God. But the work that starts with Him, that is precious. That is precious. Okay, so we've been talking about the heart of being a disciple. We looked at two different portions of scripture. Um, one where we talked about you have to pick up your cross and follow me. And I contended that that was not some picture that he was painting of, listen, you might have ideas of what a fun life is. Forget all of that and follow him. Okay, the life of a Christian is serious. Get with it. Or a picture of, you know, there are these religious, I'm sure you'll come across them if you just look around, this religious notion of, you know, making yourself a wiggly worm for Jesus. Now the problem is you can do all of this stuff and your inside can be as proud and arrogant as the most boastful person you can know. But you look so humble, I'm just a wiggly worm for Jesus. This is not picking up your cross. This is not. Picking up your cross in those series of messages I contended really has to do with the attitude of your heart being, I will serve. Okay, and long story short, remember, Jesus was saying, you must take up your cross and follow me before he died. When we hear cross, we immediately hear the instrument by which Jesus was killed. But he was talking to a congregation who was neither expecting him to die, nor had it happened. So what could they possibly have meant? You have to look deeper than just, oh, that was the thing that Jesus died. So he's saying, you got to be willing to be crucified. That is not the heart of what he's talking about there. He's saying, and he makes this point in more than one way. For example, to the disciples, he said, if you want to be the greatest, you need to be the least. Because whoever's the greatest will be the least, and whoever's the least will be the greatest. There is this attitude that says, others are more important than me. And wasn't that what Jesus embodied? Everything about him was, here is the king of kings, the one person who should never be judged, laying down his life. Moments before, hours before he was crucified, he paints this picture vividly for his disciples, who have seen him master any and every circumstance that he comes across. He has demonstrated that he is indeed the one worthy of their worship and their adoration. And so what does he do? He puts on the clothes of a servant and washes their feet. The lowest thing you could do in terms of um, relationship, in terms of status. Okay, The guy who washes your feet is nowhere like the guy who's sitting at the, you know, the big chair of the, of, of the board of directors. He's just the guy who washes his feet. That's what Jesus did. He was demonstrating what it means to use the idiom that he used, pick up your cross and follow me. Your life, if it's going to be full, 
you have to make this counterintuitive choice. Then I'll lay down my life. Do you remember he said, he who saves his life will lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake will gain it again. And we don't have time, and we don't have time, so I shouldn't take the time. We find this thought reinforced in so many places of Jesus' ministry. His whole life was about surrendering. He laid down his life. No greater love does a man have than this. He lays down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for everybody. He demonstrates this. So, you know, this world tells you you've got to look out for number one, and the number one is you. Okay? All your decisions and all your choices have to be focused around, yeah, but what am I going to get out of this? What's in this for me? And I don't mean that we necessarily do that calculation blatantly, but inside. Yeah, what's in this for me? The heart of a disciple inverts that. Yeah, but if I do this, that person will be better off. Okay, good enough. Even if it costs me. Now, I'm not talking about we be foolish and we love foolishly, but there is this thought that says others are more important than me because God has got me covered. Okay, this is also an essential part of that. It's not, let me show God how devoted I am. I'll just let my life go to waste because others are more important to me. I'm just nothing. Do you see that underneath that is yet a poisonous thought? You are not nothing. How do you know the value of something? I don't know if anybody here buys stocks or anything like that. Or forget stocks. You go to, the, you go to Costco and you want to buy a bottle of vanilla. You look at the bottle of vanilla, and it's like this little bottle, half this size. It's $45. $45? Like, that doesn't make any sense. How do you know what the value of something is? You know the value, regardless of what you might think. You might think that bottle of vanilla is not worth $45. Bucks. But the fact of the matter is, if somebody is willing to give $45 bucks for that bottle, it's worth $45. Bucks. The value of something is determined by what somebody else is willing to pay for it. Okay? So now think about the most arrogant, jerkish, nasty person you know. And that might be you, by the way. What was the price that God was willing to pay for that person? That tells you his value of that person. And anything you think that does not agree with that is incorrect. I'm not telling you that he values what they do, but that person's worth to God was his son. That tells you how valuable they are. Okay? So we are talking about not this weird, religious, fleshly idea of I'll just make myself poor because maybe God will have pity on me. It's the exact opposite. Because I own everything in Jesus, I'll lay down my life. That is what Jesus did. Do you see that? Because I am secure, I can afford to lay down my life. Because he's got my back covered, I choose to lay down my life. Your choice to lay down your life, if it isn't implicit in that, an act of faith that says, because God has got me covered, you're on the wrong platform. Okay? It is not a, it is not a test. It is not, when he says lay down your life, he's not setting a test for you, although there are going to be times when that is the issue. Okay? But in general, what he's, not, what he's not doing is trying to paint a picture of, of everybody else is worth more than me. And I just got to keep putting myself down and keep putting myself down and keep putting myself down. After all, he said, I have to decrease that he might increase. I just got to keep putting myself down and putting myself down. Secret inside that way of thinking can be, because God does not love me, let me show him that I ought to be loved. Is that not a lie from the get-go? Is that not a diabolical scheme to convince the one that Jesus gave himself for? You're not loved. Show me that I ought to love you. Talk about frustration. How can that person's life, until truth comes in and illuminates that, how can that person's life not be frustrating? You're trying so hard to get God to love you. What is God's response to that? I already love you. There's not a thing you can do to make, you, make me love you more. But the person can't see it. The person can't see it. 
So underneath this thought of laying down your life is much more than you might imagine. And then more recently we've been talking about where Jesus turns to the crowd and says, hey, unless you hate your father and your mother and your wife and your husband and your child, unless you hate them, you cannot be my disciple. And we took some time to say, okay, obviously he was not saying you actively hate them, but he was saying very clearly, here's what it costs. Nothing can be more valuable to you than me. There are things that we have to understand. The salvation of God working out in our life, it is not a partnership. It is a partnership in this way, so I've I got to be careful. It involves your cooperation. But we are not, Jesus and I are not co-workers together in this salvation. Okay, I got my ideas, he got his ideas. We talk with one another and we come up with a common plan how we can both get what we want. No! Why is it not like that? Because every idea that comes from me is worthless. Okay, I might be impressed with what I come up with. This is a good plan. In the eyes of God, compared to what he has, it's pointless. It's stupid. More to the point, what was, why was it that we were dead in our trespasses and sins? Because there was a sickness passed on to us that had at its core, you are the most important thing. How could God's salvation unfold in a context where your opinion is as equal as God's? It cannot. It is, at the very, it is the very opposite of how life has to work. And so he says, submit. Submit to me. Every place where something in your life has a value, has a priority that is higher to you than God, God is saying, there discipleship, i.e., the flow of life into you, is blocked. We can go on to say every place, every affection, everything in your life that is of more value to you, and that includes, by the way, your opinion, right? Where it is of more value to you than God, it's vulnerable. It is a place that the devil can come and attack you. The safest place for your treasures, okay, your spouse, your child, the things you love, the, the, the goals you have, the dreams you have, the safest place for them is in his hands. Okay, I remind you what we said already. When God requires of you something, so you know you're in this con contest, you love this person who's not born again, but you so love them, you want to be married to them, off you go. And then God puts this joy kill of a verse, do not be unequally yoked. So here you are facing a choice between your, this is the perfect person for me, he was made for me, or she was made for me, this is the one who will fulfill my life. And God coming along and saying, don't be unequally yoked. Do not fall for the thought that there's no difference between you and them if you're born again. Being born again is not merely a different opinion than somebody else. You are a fundamentally different creature than this person, even if you like everything the same. So all of a sudden, God has put a choice before you, if I could put it that way. God has called you to value, which is more valuable to you. Your dreams and hopes for you and this person or what I say. Now, why would God ever require that of you? Is he after making your life boring? Is he after taking things away from you? He doesn't want you to have fun? Is that what God is about? No. If he ever requires something of you, it's because he has so much more that he wants to give you instead. And this will stop it. Okay, and I just painted a picture there. You know, once you do get married to a Christian and you're walking with the Lord, it's not like that, the, the, the requirements, the choices before you somehow disappears, as if that's the only choice. We are talking about a progression into an obedience to Jesus that comes because we value what he values. And today, I want to end this consideration of being a disciple, where really, we haven't been talking, talking about the specifics of it, but rather the heart of it. 
I want to end. Last week we talked about being tasty salt. From the end of Luke chapter 14, he says, you know, look, if, he tells us in other places, you are the salt of the, earth, of the world. And here, at the end of 14, he says, look, if salt becomes tasteless, what's it good for? Right? This is just after him talking about your priorities in terms of being a disciple. And then he says, if salt becomes tasteless, what is it good for? And I pointed out to you that the only way that salt can become tasteless is if it's diluted, if it's mixed with other things. Okay, salt is not pepper. Pepper is a combination of a number of different ingredients, some of them which evaporate off with time. So you take this pepper that you have that tastes so yummy, you put it in the back of your closet. 15 years later, you'd open this bottle and say, what is this? I don't even remember this. Because you know, it's so covered with dust that you can't read the label anymore. You taste it, and surprise, it doesn't taste like pepper. Why? Because many of those ingredients have evaporated off. But salt is not like that. Salt is a pure chemical. 10,000 years from now, if that thing was in your closet, it would still taste salty. So Jesus is not talking about somehow the salt changes its property. He's getting at this. If you take this thing that could season food and you mix it with a bunch of sand, it's not going to taste salty anymore. You cannot mix yourself with the world and still see the will of God worked out in your life. It's not because God gets a hissy fit and he gets jealous. He says, well, then I'm not going to help you. It's because you cannot have the world and God. You cannot. You cannot. The world will crowd out what God says. So you've got to make a choice. You've got to make a choice. Where I want to end today is this message is really entitled, when we talk about being a disciple, the heart of the Father. Okay? Because all of our considerations about how discipleship works, and it, just to share ahead, I'm, I'm expecting as uh, fall unfolds, that we'll take time then to talk about, okay, so you're going to disciple somebody. What are the kinds of things you've got to talk about? What are, you, what are the things you've got to teach them? How do you help somebody go from they just gave their life to the Lord to becoming more and more established? Okay, and that'll be good both for us from the sense of, yeah, these are the things I need to learn to do, but also from the sense of, okay, now I know what I need to teach somebody. Okay? And I'm not trying to prescribe something. This is the pattern you must follow. Because inevitably, you working with somebody else will always involve your personal journey and what you yourself have discovered. And those will always be more of an emphasis to you than other things that you may not have such a connection to. You know? So I'll give you an example. One of the things that has so dramatically affected my own walk with the Lord is the simple instruction in all things, give thanks. Good, bad, ugly, whatever's going on, you make it a point that you give thanks. And, you know, that, following that instruction, obeying that instruction is a deep thing. Because you and I know that we face situations that there's nothing on the surface that looks like you have something to give thanks about. Your life is miserable. And God comes along and says, in all things give thanks. So all of a sudden you have some choices to make. And I will tell you that in my life, it is one of the, the key turning points in my walk with him. My willingness then to say, okay, in all things I will give thanks. I will rejoice always. So when I talk with somebody, that's going to be an emphasis, right? Because it has such an effect on me. And I think that's absolutely fine. But it cannot be the only thing you need to know about walking with God is in all things give thanks. You'll be fine. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's like a car with one wheel. Okay? Now, you might put three other wheels on it and take that one wheel off. So the Thanksgiving is a wheel, and you do need it, because a car with three wheels doesn't drive either. But a car with one wheel goes nowhere. So there are other things. Righteousness. Did you know that when God looks at you, he does not see somebody he still needs to forgive? Have you come to grips with the fact that there is not yet a sin you could come up with that he hasn't already forgiven you of? Has it dawned on you that you cannot be more forgiven tomorrow than today. You cannot be more forgiven five years from now than today. Your experience 
of his forgiveness? Sure. But from his perspective, he doesn't see someone who has yet to be forgiven. You could make this case, and I'm not going to try, but you could make the case that God actually, when he looks at that dead person next to you, who does not love God, does not see somebody who is a sinner. He sees someone who has been forgiven, but has not taken up God's offer. The, the scriptures say an interesting thing. There are two places. I, I'm not going to build something on this, okay? So I just point this out to you. Number one, he says that he is the savior of all the whole world. Not just us, but the whole world. He is the Savior. Now, of course, that rightly can be interpreted as there is no other name under heaven and earth by which a person can be saved. But he speaks as if it's been done. I'm just waiting for people to come and eat. Secondly, he te he, there's a passage in the, in the book of Revelation that says, I will not erase such and such's name from the book of life. As if What's happened is everybody's name has been written in, but it will be erased if that person doesn't receive Jesus for themselves. It's almost like God is thinking, about, I want everybody saved. I want everybody saved. Will you take me up on it? And he waits for people to choose. Okay, I don't want to build a big thing. All I wanted to say is forgiveness is such a thorough accomplishment. It is such, an, it is such a completed work by Jesus. That if you take hold of it, things that have gripped your life as if it was master over you will lose their power. Okay? We are no longer under, why will we not be mastered by sin? Does anybody remember from the book of Romans? You will not be mastered by sin. Sin shall not be master over you. Why? Because you try really hard. No. Because you got the right counseling you need. No. Why shall sin not be master over you? Because we are no longer under law. We are under grace, is what Romans says. Maybe he's crazy. Maybe he's exaggerating. But I think not. Maybe we have not understood what it means to be forgiven. So that's a pretty essential plank in your, in your platform, eh? How released you are. And there are other things that we just need to learn. Here's how to do things. Here's how to do things. Here's how to do things. If, and the goal is not to come up with this uniform population of people who behave the same way. The goal is that you might have it, have life, and have it abundantly. That it would be manifesting in you. And because it's manifesting in you, it can manifest in those around me. The more people who are enjoying the life of God, the more people can affect this place with the life of God. And that's what God wants. That's what God wants. A long time ago, it was said to us, and I'll repeat it, God wants every person you meet to obtain a benefit for having done so. If that benefit is just you said hi to them, and for a moment they came across somebody who was pleasant as opposed to nasty, if that's all they can receive, so be it. But God wants every person that you encounter to receive a benefit for having done so. Because God is with you. Where you go, God goes. You, this is not the, this is sloppy. This is a sloppy way of putting it, but I'll put it this way. You carry God into every circumstance you go into. And so God is present to make all the difference in every single person's life but he will not force himself, okay? So, the heart, when we've talked about all these different things about being a disciple, I just want to remind you at the end, what is God's heart about you being a disciple, okay? Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Okay, and the context of this is, you know, the holy people, the guys who thought themselves to be holy were grumbling that Jesus was hanging out with the low life. Okay, the people who obviously are not godly, because if they were, they'd be like us, right? They obviously are not godly. In that context, Jesus began to speak some parables, and this is one of them. And he said, a man had two sons. This is verse 11. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. 
So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the, young son, the younger son gathered every, everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there, he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf. Kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life. And again, he was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now, the, his older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the older son, he became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years, I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet, you have never given me a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes and killed the fattened calf, you killed the fattened calf, and, uh, calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. All of our commands and all of our instructions and all that we do is pointless if we have not captured why the Father would tell you those things. Here we have two sons. One is doing what we call, yeah, that's a bad son. The other one, at least on the outside, is the good son. Okay, because he's doing everything his dad says. But you can see by his reaction to the things that have happened, I'm not sure it's right to call good son bad son. This father had two bad sons. Okay? Sonship is about much more than do you do what I tell you. We do not deny you need to do what the father says. No question. But can you see that neither son had captured the heart of the father? Neither son understood what the father was like. The older son was doing what he was doing because he was supposed to. He's the good, responsible, older guy. The younger son is uh, an idiot, for lack of a better way of putting it. He takes the privileges that are his, treats them as if he is somehow entitled to it, and lives a life that is in keeping with that attitude, and he loses all of it. And when he comes back, his father celebrates over him. We don't have enough time. I mean, this parable is something you could just stay and read and meditate on for days and days and days and days and months. Because there's such a rich, richness here. Remember, he was talking to a group of people who thought they were the holy ones. They understood what God was like. They understood what God wants. They were the proper ones. They were the older brother. They could not understand 
why God would go after the low life, the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the liars and the cheats. Why is he giving them attention when we're the ones who are reading the scriptures and trying to do what God wants? They could not understand why God would be interested in them because they did not understand the heart of the Father. And the younger son clearly didn't understand the heart of the Father. His life of privilege went to his head and he thought it was all about him. And he certainly did not understand. And this is a pretty challenging thing, what I'm about to say. Because I think it's reasonable. I can certainly understand the thought that says, I am not worthy to be called your son. Just make me like a hired man. But I contend that line explains to you he did not know what his father was like. If you knew what the father was like, you would not be surprised that when you came back to him, he celebrated over you. He couldn't think that way. It was not in his head. All he could think of was, I blew it, I don't deserve it. And the thought of, I don't deserve it, which is true, was what ruled him, not the great love that the father has for him. And the older son was certainly not ruled by the great love the father has for him. Did you notice when the older son gets uppity, he doesn't say, well, fine then. You're not getting anything I want either. He says, you know, everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. It's an interesting thing. Um, the father, when the younger son comes, he tells the slaves to go and bring a robe and a ring. Okay? And what I understand from that is that was an idiom of saying, restore him completely to his position. Okay? The ring was how you purchase things back then. When you didn't have a ring, you couldn't put it on the family account, if you could put it that way. Right? Because you could go, to the, you could go to, the, uh, to the market and say, I want that cow. I'm making, I don't know the specifics of the marketplace over there, but I want that cow. Why well, are you going to pay for it? Here's my ring. Ah, you're from the house of so-and-so. No worries, I'll come and get it later. And the cow goes home with you. It's like a credit card. Because the ring indicates uh, he's good to pay. So now the ring is gone. off the father Because the guy is so idiotic, he probably sold his ring to be able to buy something to eat. The thing that was the most valuable thing about him, he gets rid of. And so he can't buy anything. And so when he comes back, he's just expecting to be made just like a hired man. But the father puts his ring back on. He said, I restore you to completely everything you were. What an extraordinary thing. What is in this father's mind? Doesn't he know what his son is like? Yes, he does. He knows exactly what his son is like. That isn't the problem. Do you know what the father is like? That's the issue. It's also worth saying, clearly this father was not limited for wealth. Clearly. He had no problem restoring the son and still saying to the older one, everything is mine is yours. Don't worry about it. It's like he had an infinite supply so he could afford to be generous. Does that remind you of anybody? Somebody with an infinite supply and so he can afford to be infinitely generous. Is that what you think of the Father? When he tells you, follow me, and I don't want to deny there are times of discipline if you're going to be a Christian. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, there are going to be times where because of your rebellion, God does certain things to get your attention, say, don't do that again. Why would he do it? When you think of following him, is this what is in your heart? Or do you have some picture that says, I just got to follow him because, you know, that's the only way. That, you know, okay, I'll do whatever you want. It's sort of more of a surrender of the outside, but the inside is still upset. Your heart has not been captured by the thought, God only has good for me. Whatever you say, fine by me. Even this best thing that I think that you want me to lay down right now, you only got good for me. 
Good? Fine. Is your heart so captured by the heart of the Father that when you stumble and you fall, you are still able to pick yourself up and walk boldly into the presence and say, here I am. Father, I want to tell you I did these things and I was completely wrong. Forgive me. But you're not standing on the outside thinking, I hope he lets me in. I don't deserve to be there. What is your thought about God? He's the one who makes all these difficult things happen in my life. And maybe one day it'll all figure it out, but I just don't understand. Is that what you think of him? I want to tell you again, each of us, you, me, and everybody listening, and everybody you know, there is a call of God on their life saying, follow me. And what he is saying is, I know where you are. I know what's going on. I know what's broken. I know what's missing. I know where you made choices to break your life, and I know where other things happened to break your life. I know it. You just come with me. I will bring you into fullness with no consideration of whether you deserved it or not, because you couldn't. Because you couldn't. No thought about, I'm doing well, and so I'm more in line with what God wants. I'm not doing so well, so God ain't going to help me. None of that, because that's not God's calculation. You didn't deserve it. How, do you, how is it that at your worst day, you don't deserve it, but on your best day, when you still don't see how wicked and and worthless you are, you think you deserve it. From God's perspective, it's, you know, you're drowning in 100 feet or you're drowning in 75 feet. God doesn't look at how high you've managed to climb up before he can rescue you. He just reaches down and pulls you up. 75 feet, 100 feet, 300 feet, doesn't matter. He reaches down, pulls you up. But the issue is, will you follow? So, I pray that you hear God's not merely telling you some new commands about you get your life straight, get your act in gear, stop messing about and get serious. And you know, it's true, we need to get serious about following the Lord. But that isn't the heart with which God calls you. The heart is the heart of the Father here that says, I want to give to my son, I want to give to my daughter all that is mine. Okay, we touched upon this last week. If a family is healthy and a, and a father is wise, all the stuff that he accumulates, he's not thinking to hold on to it for himself. Hey, look, I worked hard to get all this stuff. You work hard too. No. A healthy father is saying, all that I have, I want my children to have. I'm not holding it out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not keeping this from myself and you go get your own. Everything a father accumulates, he wants his son to have. He wants his daughter to have. Now, leave aside the poor pictures that we might have gathered from our experience with our parents. This is the perfect father. And here you find the heart of the father. It is with this heart that he calls you. Come to me. Follow me. Give that up. Take this on. Don't do that. Do this. It is with this heart that you are called to follow him. Can you say amen? amen? We just ask you, Father, that you would work so deep within our hearts that the places where we resent that the way of God is the way of God, where we would rather that it be something else, where we resent having to say yes to you or to be obedient to you, just ask you to touch those places. I ask you to so thoroughly capture us with your heart that the joy of our life is to be your disciple. That when we hear the idea, the thought, the call to be your disciple, it causes us to rejoice. For we were dead and you're calling us into life. I ask you to help us with these things so that not only would, we, would our minds say yes, but our very hearts and all of our choices would be lined up with this. I love my father. and My father loves me and he only has good plans, so I say yes. Father, we also offer ourselves to be instruments through which others might be brought into the reality of your love for them. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.